Hi, I'm Reza Zukafi and you're watching Tamu Awani. And with me today is Professor George Fitzgerald Smoot, the director of the Berkeley Center for Cosmological Physics and who was awarded the 2006 Nobel Prize, Peace, uh, Nobel Prize in Physics. Now, Professor Smoot is here in Malaysia to present a keynote speech in the event series Bridges to Dialogue, a dialogue towards a culture of peace. The Bridges program have been initiated and facilitated by International Peace Foundation under the joint patronage of 21 Nobel Peace Prize laureates. Welcome, Professor Smoot, to the show. Thank the first much. question would be on how did you get into the world of physics and especially astrophysics? Because I know physics is really difficult. I mean, astrophysics would be 10 times more difficult, I guess. No, no, you're not <laughs> supposed to say it's difficult. You're supposed to say it's really interesting and okay. exciting <laughs> and that, that young people can consider it. Okay. And in fact, it is a draw mm -hmm. to bring young people into science and technology. That's mm -hmm. where we get a lot of our future engineers. Mm -hmm. That people see these beautiful pictures of the heavens mm -hmm. and they hear about it and they learn uh, a little bit about it. They mm -hmm. say that's really interesting, mm -hmm. and they learn a little more, and mm -hmm. and they and then they realize, well, the math. It's worth doing a little effort to do the math, and mm -hmm. it's not so hard at the beginning. And so okay. We have a website okay. called, called the universeadventure.org, uh -huh. in which we design for middle and high school students to mm -hmm. go and learn about the universe, and we give them simple little problems mm -hmm. just to show them that learning physics isn't as hard as people say. It's only hard when you don't think you're going to get something out of it, but when you're going to learn about the world you live in mm -hmm. and these wonderful, spectacular things about the universe we know, then students are motivated to it. And then some of them then decide, well, you know, technology isn't so bad. I'll become an engineer or I'll become a computer scientist. But others decide they'll become scientists, okay. a small percentage. But how did, how did you get into that world? Uh, I was always interested in how things worked. And uh -huh. it started when I was very young. Mm -hmm. My family w went over for a trip to visit my cousins, who mm -hmm. were the same age as me. They were quite young, uh, before I was in the first grade. Mm -hmm. right? And uh, we were driving home at night. And I could see the moon out the back window. Uh, and I noticed the moon was following us all the way across the state, right? They, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. they lived two hours away. To me, it was a huge dis long distance, a big trip, you know. And it's following. So I asked my parents, how can the moon be following us? Mm -hmm. And they said, no, it's not following us. Everybody thinks the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I said, how can that be? And they explained the moon was so big and so far away, everyone in the world could see it. But it just depended on one time of day, they could mm -hmm. see it. And then they showed me how things that are far away that, that you know, you can see them, and things that are closer when you look with one eye, it's another. And I understood you could uh, understand it from reason, and I thought, this is great, mm -hmm. because you can now understand how the world works, and I learned more, and so forth. So my parents helped educate me, and then mm -hmm. when I got to school, I wanted to know more, and I just kept doing that. But I was interested in many things. I thought I might be wanted a doctor, or I might want to do other kinds of things. Okay. But it just turned out that, that physics was, was the place where I, I, I enjoyed it the most, and mm -hmm. I did the best. And I really wanted to know the answers about how the world is made and what's our place mm -hmm. and where we're going to go to. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about your research, measurement of the black body form and cosmic microwave and background radiation, which um, gave you the Nobel Peace Prize for physics, right? Right. So I got the Nobel Prize in physics mm -hmm. for a particular piece of work. Mm -hmm. And it sounds complicated. But what this really is, is the, the relic radiation we were able to show mm -hmm that this radiation we see is a microwave background, sort of the same as cell phones and, and microwave ovens, mm -hmm. the same sort of wavelength. That radiation uh, came as a relic from the beginning of the universe. From the Big Bang. Right, from the Big Bang. Okay. So just like we see light from the sun and we get an image of the sun, mm -hmm. then knowing this is light from the beginning of the universe, mm -hmm. we can use that light to make an image of the beginning of the universe. Right. And the way okay. we can do that okay. is not because we were back at that time, mm -hmm. but because we were looking so far away that light takes nearly 14 billion years to get to us. So we can look back 14 billion years in time. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the sun, you see it eight minutes ago. You look at Jupiter, it's 40 minutes ago. You look at it to so the nearest stars. So that light stars. is const constantly existing in the universe. It's just that you have to tap into the image of the light. Right. And, and then you can see how the universe was right. formed. So the whole trick is you can sort of see the whole history of the universe. Mm -hmm. Just look out further. Mm -hmm. You look out to the nearest stars. You look back 10 years. Mm -hmm. You look out to the Andromeda galaxy. It's 2 million years, right? 2 million years yeah, ago, yeah, there okay, were no okay, humans okay, on the okay, Earth. Okay, okay. You look out further and further. You see further and further back. So I chose the problem of looking back as far as you can possibly see, which is back to the beginning of the universe. Most challenging, I bet. And <laughs> it, it was very challenging, but in some sense, it turns out to be 
one of the more straightforward and simple, uh -huh. although I, I'm ashamed to admit it took me two decades, 20 years of hard work, okay. to develop the techniques, right, to develop the instrumentation, mm -hmm. because what we had in the beginning were relatively crude radio receivers, mm -hmm. and over time, we built better and better ones, and we developed better and better techniques mm -hmm. in order to make the measurements, and so it took 20 years mm -hmm. to finally get to the point that we could put a really good instrument on a satellite and get the satellite up in orbit mm -hmm. and get a picture of the whole sky. Now we had a second satellite, which is taking data, and later this month, we're hoping to launch the third satellite, which will have even more wavelengths and better Ranger resolution and make an even more precise measurement. So we're crossing our fingers that it, it goes up. Okay. Well, how did you get to that point? I mean, did you, did you study the people before you, or was there, was there a research that stopped somewhere and you figured that, oh, I should probably continue this with my own research? Right. Well, it's a combination. You uh -huh. look back to the people that are great scientists or scientists you know. I had a number of mentors. Mm -hmm. Some of them were Nobel laureates. Some of them were other just very outstanding scientists. Mm -hmm. And you saw how they worked and behaved. But the other thing that I did was I went and I saw this problem, which looked to most people like, well, it was not science at all. It was mm -hmm. just you know people guessing and so forth. And realized that there was an opportunity to look at this radiation and determine, well, did it come from the Big Bang? And if it did come from the Big Bang, then it was a tool to study the early universe. Mm -hmm. and so, it, so it was to pick a problem that no matter how it came out, as long as I was able to work on it, that I could eventually solve mm -hmm. and that would be a very important problem, mm -hmm. even if it took a long time to do it. And it took much longer than we thought, although we had discoveries along the way. I mean, only, if, only like three or four years after I started, mm -hmm. we discovered the fact that the Earth and the solar system and the galaxy are actually moving through space. Mm -hmm. They're being pulled by a large mass of the galaxies off in the distance, and their gravitational attraction is pulling the so entire... So the, the galaxy is constantly moving, The right? galaxy is uh, being pulled away from... There's a general expansion of the universe, but, uh -huh. and the galaxies kind of just sit there, and the space increases, but our galaxy is moving relative to that, and it's because over here, uh -huh. there's a huge group of galaxies, uh -huh. millions of galaxies, and the combined gravity of those are pulling us over billions of years, and pulling us up to a high speed going in that direction. So we made that discovery, in the late 1970s, right near the beginning of it. And then we kept building better receivers and putting them on balloons and airplanes and higher and higher until finally the satellite. Uh, I'm sure it would cost quite a lot, right? To, to, to get to the point where you discover something. I mean, you've got to have satellites and balloons mm -hmm. and imageries and all that. Right, and you have to show that you're ready for them. I mean, they don't just give you a, a, a balloon or a satellite or whatever, uh -huh. you know. You have to show that your equipment is ready and working and that you've done the best you can do from the ground and go to the next level and so forth. Did you, did you get any government support for that? Uh, most, most of what paid for it was government support. Mm -hmm. So you know, I got part of my salary from the university, from mm -hmm. teaching, but they also, it's a research university, so you're paid to teach, but you're also expected to do research. Mm -hmm. So my salary was paid that way. And I also occasionally got fellowships or things for graduate students. But mostly I applied for government grants, mm -hmm. and I got grants. And when those succeeded, I could apply for new ones. And then eventually I proposed for the satellite Right. And that got accepted, right? called your discovery as the greatest discovery of the mm -hmm. century now. What's the subsequent discoveries of that that you can actually apply to real life, in real life? You, you mean you're asking why he said it, or are you asking what, is, what does it mean to us? Yeah, yeah, what does how it mean is it going to gonna change and, our and, life? Yeah, yeah, how yeah. is it going to change our life, yeah. Yes, so as of now, mm -hmm. it's too early to know what it's going to be economically liable mm -hmm. for, but it has changed people's perspective about you know, who they are, where they come from, and mm -hmm. what the beginning of the universe is. It's very strong evidence that we know about the beginnings of the universe. And now, following along that, we can then predict eventually the formation of galaxies and clusters of galaxies and even larger scale structure. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that you'll see in the pictures, I have pictures like from the Hubble telescope and one of the things, mm -hmm. you'll see this picture and you'll see thousands of galaxies in this picture. Mm -hmm. And some of the galaxies look just like the galaxy we live in. That was mm -hmm. one of the things that our satellite showed was the first good image of our own galaxy. Mm -hmm. Hard from inside of it, but you can still kind of do it. And then you start asking a question, why are there so many galaxies? And it's not just thousands. Mm -hmm. There are hundreds of billions of galaxies out there 
that are potentially visible to us with, mm -hmm. the, with, the, with the space telescope. And so you can predict why, why there should be that many galaxies. You can predict how they should be distributed and how they formed mm -hmm. and how old they are, you know, when the first generation of stars came on and the second generation. And so we now can say everything in this room mm -hmm. was once inside of a star and then was ejected from a star, mm -hmm. right? And because we now know that we make only hydrogen, helium, and a little bit of light elements mm. in the beginning of the universe, and then to make carbon and nitrogen, oxygen, and iron, all the stuff that this is made out of and this is made out of, mm -hmm. that had to go through a star, either come out in a stellar wind or a supernova, mm -hmm. and so forth. So we, we know the solar system formed only about four and a half billion years ago, mm -hmm. and the universe is 14 billion years old. Well, we had to have first the formation of the stars and galaxies, then we had to burn that first generation of stars, mm -hmm. and then we had to make the second generation of stars and planets, right? And in the case of the solar system, there was a f one star that made most of the material, but it looks like there was another supernova, it was starting to cool down, another supernova went off, and the shock wave from that mm -hmm. collapsed and collapsed our solar system and mixed a little material in. Mm -hmm. So these are things that we're, we're learning, and they change our perspective, because we now know the Earth is only going around one of, of 100 billion stars in our galaxy, mm -hmm. and we know there's hundreds of billions of galaxies, so that means there are, and we know around the 50 nearest stars, in 50 of the 200 nearest stars, there are planets, right? So you start thinking how many planets there are in our galaxy, okay. and how many galaxies there are, right? You start realizing mm -hmm. that the Earth is probably not so unique, it's rare, but it's not particularly unique. So you start wondering, is there life on other planets? I was about to ask that question. Yes. Do you believe that there's life out there? I think that there are so many chances, even if the chance of life is very low, mm -hmm. you have 100 billion times 100 billion, mm -hmm. right? You're even, even in the most unlikely case, there's very likely a uh, chance that there is life on other planets. And then the question, is there intelligent life, mm -hmm. right? And why haven't we seen them, right? And that the answer is probably it's unlikely enough there's only a few or less per galaxy, mm -hmm. but you still have 100 billion galaxies. So yeah, yeah, there could yeah. be, there can be, the pro I think that there's probably, so now we come back to the question of mm -hmm. how does that change your view of mankind? Well, we have a story about where we came from, mm -hmm. you know, and, and how it is both uh, real, they're gonna be planets like the Earth, but our particular Earth is an accident, mm -hmm. right? in a certain sense, it just came into being, but that there's probably other alien civilizations out there, right? How does that, change your perspective yeah. about it. And it makes all humans more bonded, mm -hmm. right? And it makes them realize it's a very big universe out there. And to not so necessarily get trapped in the day-to-day -day things of the Earth, mm -hmm. to step back and have perspective and realize that it's better for people to work together and go to a common good future mm -hmm. so that we'll be ready to meet other cultures. So it probably mm -hmm. takes centuries for us before we could probably know or find out whether there's something out there or not. It, it, it could happen tomorrow or it could happen in a thousand years, mm -hmm. we don't know. Which brings us to facts and fiction. If, if, there, if there's lots of galaxies out there, do you think Star Wars would be, you know, the movie would be fact or fiction? Well, <laughs> it's funny. The, uh, a lot of the TV things and the uh -huh. movies, they, uh, the ones that are really good, they, they have good advisors uh -huh. for, for, uh, to get, try and get the science right. But when it's necessary for dramatic effect or for mm -hmm. the plot, they will modify the laws of right, mm -hmm. uh, of science in order to, to get a good story. Mm -hmm. You can understand that because that's entertainment rather than, than education. And uh, so on Star Trek, every place they go, there's mm -hmm. life, right? Yeah, 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 <laughs> that's quite probably true. unlikely. Okay. It's probably life is relatively rare, but it doesn't mean so. But it would be very boring to have them and the starship going and going and going and visiting a rock and then going and going. Right. It's much more exciting to, so, so to see. So life might be in a very primitive form, in a very yeah. advanced form, but you know, it yeah. just goes to sort of something in between right. a human form like. Right. So what about time warp and space warp? I mean, you go into a black hole and then you appear into another galaxy. Would that be possible? It's possible, although well, it's tricky. So, uh -huh. so there used to be a show called Deep Space Nine, uh -huh. which was set up next to a wormhole that went to somewhere, it's, which yeah, is yeah. A, like it's like a great trading route. Uh -huh. right? So in the old days, right, some cities grew up on the great trading routes, mm -hmm. with control of a river or control of a pass through the mountains or something. Like that. And, but if you do the calculations, I've I actually had students in courses that take, I have them do the calculations of what would happen to you if you went through a wormhole mm -hmm. that had the characteristics, that, so only a kilometer in, in radius or diameter, 
and the, the tidal stresses, the fact that the, the, the energy is so dense that the gravitational attraction mm -hmm. is very fierce. So the difference between the gravitational attraction in your feet mm -hmm. and your head would be enough to tear you to pieces. Right? That's quite efficient, right? Right, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so you need a force field to hold you together to go uh -huh. through that. I mean, it, you need some additional science to make it work. But it is just barely possible that if you make a very carefully designed thing that was about the size of a small chip mm -hmm. and it's made of silicon, it could just hold itself together to go through the so you need stuff you'd be made of silicon for, for right. you to be able to withstand that, that pull, right. right, you would need a force field to hold you mm -hmm. together uh, to get through that. You need a much bigger diameter wormhole, which is very expensive in terms of energy to make. And we now know energy costs money, right? And then you have a lot of contradictions, because if you can travel great distances in a very short time, mm -hmm. you have a causality issue. That's the same problem with time travel, that if you can travel back in time, and kill your grandfather before he meets your grandmother. Mm -hmm. What happens to you, right? It's <laughs> that's quite possible, right? Like time well, no, no, well, there seems to be a censorship that prevents that from happening. Uh -huh. Because if it were possible... Then you would change the course of, the, of, of history. You, you could change the course of history, uh -huh. but you'd also think there'd be time tourists. Uh, right, just like there are tourists now that come to Kuala Lumpur to, to visit And go to sea. probably Rome during the ancient right. time and, and probably and go to mess right. with some stuff. And right, and you know, you want to go and see certain things, right? Uh -huh. And so why don't we see tourists, right? Uh -huh. Well, there has to be some, some mechanism that protects it. The, the interesting thing about the Big Bang is it actually makes a space that's physically very big and very orthogonal to the time coordinate. Mm -hmm. So the time progresses in the right direction. And so in that particular space, it's very, very expensive to try and do time travel. It costs you you know, like a star's worth of energy. Just but it's possible, right? I, I it's it. theoretically <laughs> possible, I, but, but no one, you have to create... It's very hopeful. <laughs> <It's> very <laughs> you have to create certain kinds of material, which we have, like cosmic strings or things like that. Uh -huh. You need things that can warp space-time in a special way, mm -hmm. which we don't happen to have handy. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, we didn't speculate that. But one of, the, one of the excitements we've had is we've discovered there is some new force of material in the universe because we've seen that the universe, which the expansion, which has been slowing down for mm -hmm. billions of years, has started to speed up, right? And that means gravity has gone from being always attractive mm -hmm. to having, in, having a negative portion to it. And that's surprising. That requires a whole different kind of, of energy in the universe that we didn't suspect existed before. And uh, the, the, the thing is, you know, why did the universe expand? And it's, it's, it's a scary thing because what it means is the universe is going to mm -hmm. grow bigger and bigger, and it means that galaxies and things we can now see are eventually going to go out of sight because when they get so far away, mm -hmm. the space between us is growing faster than light can travel across it. So even though they're there and the light's traveling, it's just never going to get to us ever, right, mm -hmm. unless something changes. And so we have to understand, will it keep accelerating or will it slow down? The future of the universe is holding on it. But if it keeps accelerating, our future is dismal. Okay. We, we eventually get lonely. You know, it's like you're old and lonely and there's no energy and there's no, nobody else around you, mm -hmm. right? And the, the other case was if there's way too much matter and too much acceleration, too much deceleration, the universe will actually collapse in and you'll, you'll go in a fiery death. There's only a, a fine line of the media, you know, you have mm -hmm. to behave and walk down the middle of the, <laughs> mm -hmm. of the middle path. Mm -hmm. It's the only way that gives you a long future. <laughs>
wow. and the space is like gravity change sign. So, so, so the two dots on the piece of paper will never meet, right, at the end? In the, no, at the end? not unless you fold the fold the space up. So the space is not right. like that, space is not... Right, uh, uh, and so people have tried to invent these kind of warp drives uh -huh. and so forth, where you take two pieces of space and, and you, you squeeze the space between them or you bend the space around uh -huh. so you can just jump between them, uh -huh. right? And there are ways to do that, sort of, if space is very scrunchy, which it kind of is, you could, if you could hook over here to here, mm -hmm. you can scrunch the space, travel across a little distance and let go and it's big distance, right? Well, that's possible, right? <laughs> yeah, but again, it costs more energy than the sun puts out. But <laughs> to do that, but <laughs> okay. it just means we need R&D, right? Uh -huh. We need in more energy efficient warp drives, right? So okay. it's theoretically possible. I don't know how anybody would do it. it would be, it's also theoretically possible to stop the Earth from rotating uh -huh. and rotate it the other way. It just would be a big engineering problem, right? Are, are we closer to, under, to fully understand the, 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 the concept of the universe, how it, is, how it begins and how it's going to end and everything? I, I think that the interesting thing is we have a very good picture now of the history of the universe, and mm -hmm. we're filling in some of the pieces, but we really have a good idea from a very early fraction, right? So just from embryo universe right up to the present day, which is mm -hmm. kind of a not quite middle-aged, but it's young adult universe. It's got some more cycles to go. We have a very good picture of that in terms mm -hmm. of life cycle. But, but what happens when you do that, then you have more questions. You have the question of what is this dark energy? What is this mysterious dark matter, which we haven't talked about? There's, mm -hmm. We know that 80, at least 80% of the matter out of the universe is not like the matter you and I are made out of. It's mm -hmm. a completely different form of matter we've never seen before. Right? And so, and then there's a question about what, what actually made the very beginning of the universe. Mm -hmm. We have very simple models that you can do calculations and they give you the right answer because mm -hmm. you can compare it to what we observe from the conditions at the very beginning of the universe. So we, we can describe the universe very well, but mm -hmm. it gives us profound new questions but it also tells us there's some new pieces of physics that is new fundamental forces that we can understand and who knows. And there's also an implication there may be extra dimensions, right? Which, yeah. would, which would be kind of exciting. How do you change the perception and mix and, and, and make maths and physics interesting and cool? So that you know, you can, these, these kids are more inclined to learn about this stuff and, and not avoid them totally. Okay. So I have a couple different approaches. One is we're trying to create a global teachers academy mm -hmm. to, to, to use cosmology and the beautiful pictures you can get from, from, from astrophysics and from the space telescopes and mm -hmm. so forth. And, uh, but kids do sort of instinctively know that going to space is cool and more, more modern. So that's a way to link them in to understanding that it's actually interesting and it can be cool. Mm -hmm. um, the other is we're sponsoring like a YouTube contest to, oh, okay, to, okay. to do that. But I was surprised when I went to Korea that they, they actually like geeks. They, they actually think it's a cool thing, right? Oh. And, uh, <laughs> but there's another thing I did. So there's a, there's a new show, it's just in its second year mm -hmm. in the United States, a sitcom called The Big Bang Theory. You, you were in it. And yeah. I just, <laughs> and just, so just before I came to Asia, I, I, did a, I filmed an episode mm -hmm. and uh, that was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. But this is one of the things where it is kind of geeky guys, but they're kind of cool. They're doing, you know, they're being played off against. They're comparing geek society to normal society and mostly making fun of the geeks. But at least here are scientists uh -huh. who are main characters in the show. And some of the things they say actually make sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're, they're, they're shown as real people and struggling and, and doing things that are a little broadly drawn. Mm -hmm. right. so, you, so you have to put beautiful people on, on, on air just to kind of encourage this. Right. You have to have role models for people. Mm -hmm. People need role models to see that it's socially acceptable. Mm -hmm. You, you learn by doing it, mm -hmm. but you also learn by seeing how the people who are really good at, mm -hmm. at it, you, and you see what they do that's good, and you see what, you need examples, mm -hmm. both to see that you, first to understand you could be on yourself, mm -hmm. but second of all, to improve your technique and, and to get more experienced, right? But the method of teaching, should it be different? Should it be the same? Because, because I think kids nowadays are more, uh, are more, you know, they are more op open to the internet and all that, and right. learning should be fast and more interesting instead of, you know, one teacher standing in front of the class, and the rest will just follow suit. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Eventually, the teachers have to be confident enough and excited enough about mm -hmm. the material that they are partners with the, with the students. Mm -hmm. A lot of times now, the teachers are afraid because the students come in having learned on the internet and know as much as the teacher does and mm -hmm. have questions the teacher can't answer. And uh, we have to make it so that, that teachers feel confident and that they feel like they're partners in 
they're sharing with the students. If the student learns something that they don't know, mm -hmm. that they, they shouldn't be afraid of losing control, they should be thinking this is a great opportunity. There should it's, be more interaction. Right, and, right. Mm -hmm. and that's what happens when you do research with a student. The student, you know, you, the student comes and asks you for a problem, you give them a problem, they come back and tell you their solutions, and you, you learn something and you feed back and forth, right? Mm -hmm. it's a part, it becomes a partnership. Tell us about your role in, in Bridges Dialogue towards a culture of peace. I mean, astrophysics and peace, how does that relate to each other? Right. It, it, it's not obvious to begin with, uh -huh. although I, it turns out I'm in a number of organizations that are trying to promote peace, peace. And, uh -huh. and understanding. I think it's not just peace that you want. You want people to recognize that they're, they have a stake in having the world run well, mm -hmm. and it's because there is a future for people that is bright, mm -hmm. they can have an improving standard of living, they can have a lifestyle that's very good, mm -hmm. and they can have partners all around the world that will interact with them. And so I come both to have dialogue. First to show, we have to have some common ground. Mm -hmm. and so telling them about where the universe came. It, the one thing all of mankind is going to have is a common heritage. Mm -hmm. That is, we're all going to have come from the Big Bang, mm -hmm. we're all going to have come from the solar system that came after that, and, and we're all going to live on the Earth. Right? That's what makes us human mm -hmm. now. So you have to think about what is going to allow people the most freedom and the most satisfaction in their lives and yet still have the world run well mm -hmm. and run according to, you know, in a, in a way that benefits everyone. And the first thing is to step back and look and see how tiny and precious the Earth is mm -hmm. and how many other, someday we may meet other species, other mm -hmm. cultures. And, you know, but just understanding that we all have a common heritage and a common place that we're living and growing. So thank you so much, Professor George Fitzgerald-Smooth so for, for enlightening us on astrophysics and the works of it. Thank you very much for being on Tarmu Awani. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's all we have for today. And we're going to be talking to more people. So stay tuned to Tarmu Awani. I'm Rizal Zokapi. Uh, this is Astro Awani, your gateway to the world. Thank you.